So where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> When's the interview start? <laughs> I thought I'd get that out of the way before I accidentally say it in the middle of the thing. You gotta say it, it you gotta say it again. So where do you get your ideas from? Oh, no, I don't wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do this seriously. This is for your DVD. Yeah, so what? I'm, so I'm taking it seriously. I, I'm trying to be <laughs> like Piers Morgan. All right, okay. <clears throat> Piers Morgan. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so Will Devokis, thank you for doing this. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for doing it for me. Hey, I appreciate it. So it's great to have you here. We're going to have a little bit of a director on director chat about yourself. And of course, your movie, Macabre Medicine, which I know very much. I, I know the name very well. I've heard it many times. And I, uh, I should probably be able to write a book about it myself, but I'm going to let you do the talking um and and how long ago is it now like what's the anniversary at so when i uh i sat down a couple months ago and i found a file i was going through hard drives just organizing them and i found a file one of the earliest files for the movie was from 2006. that's ancient and it, it wasn't it feels anything. ancient it, well, it, it is ancient. It, it, it's almost 20 years old. I think that's like, what, 18 years or something like that. So when I found this file, I was like, what is this? And so we there was a script. There is a script that we had, an early draft from like 07. But this was just like a non-cohesive, like just ideas just being thrown like down. Sort of bare, a bit of a mixture of bare bones, a bit of a, you know, prototype type thing. Ideas, yeah, and, and just kind of getting my thoughts out. And it was really hard for me to understand because back then I didn't really know how to write a screenplay or even take notes. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. But that was like the whole beginning of this. And, uh, it, you know, it kind of, as you know, it kind of grew from there. So it was really interesting yeah. to find that. And I kind of sat back and said, but damn it, you know, it's been a while. I haven't released the movie for various reasons. So um, I think it's time for all the people who kind of worked hard on this fucking thing to, to get it out, you know? Absolutely. Well, you hear about those kind of stories of like these lost movies. And, and I think that's kind of a good marketing thing sometimes. I don't think it hurts at the end of the day because there's always a little bit of intrigue and mystery. And um, I think that when these things don't come out, I think they become a little bit more valuable just to see, you know, what was going on at the time. Because obviously we all change as filmmakers and I think it's going to be a real kick for people to go back and see kind of like your, you know, origins, you know. I mean, you know, there's just like you I know mean, we, we both kind of came up at the same time making films. Uh, I have a whole plethora of things on YouTube, you know, <laughs> before that it was it was a site called vMix, which doesn't exist. Yeah. So they can go back and look at that. But this was like the first major, this was like a big deal for me because it was like the first right. time I ever tried to raise money. It was the first time I ever tried to like make a feature, you know? Yeah. And yeah. boy, did things go wrong. <laughs> well, you know, it happens though. I, I remember like that day when I decided I'm going to make a movie and I'm going to do it properly. And then you get all these problems that come up because you're trying to do things a little bit differently. You're trying to kind of get out of that college mentality. But then in turn, sometimes, I mean, for me personally, um, many times I felt like, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to go back and do it like it's a college movie. And and that's when it ended up being a little bit more successful. I don't know if it was because we had less pressure in our heads, but um, I remember seeing clips of it and I remember seeing pictures. But uh, what was kind of like the genesis of the story? Like, what was it that made you make that movie in particular? Where did it all come from? Well, the movie that we well, that I originally wrote didn't get made. The movie that got made uh, was so I wrote a script and uh, I had studied like I wanted to make a movie that was like really reminiscent of like 1970s exploitation. Now, to me, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween are are exploitation horror films. Mm -hmm. Um even though they don't really have that much blood, that's kind of what they kind of got branded as. But you have a yeah. whole slew of other movies that are lesser known that kind of, you know, play on the exploit. There's more nudity. There's more sex. Yeah. Violence. Yeah. You know, and um, 
I wanted to do something like that, make it like almost like Last House on the left. Uh, the Hills Have Eyes, you know, very mm. early Craven. And um, I studied a lot of serial killers, and I was like, I I'm going to do a really low to no budget movie, but make it feel like like an ex like a like a Grindhouse film. And yeah. I think the early like when I w so in school when I was in high school when I came up with this project we had to do a final project at the end of the year called a STEM project, Sussex Tech Exhibition of Mastery. And what you do is you write a huge paper, you have to interview somebody, and it's all about what you've learned throughout your four years at this school because you have to pick a tech area. And I chose media broadcast, the closest thing to get to filmmaking. And um, everybody usually has to do a project, you know. I mean, that's kind of like the point of it, like – Show what show us what you've done, what you've learned. Yeah, it'd be yeah, kind of yeah, a yeah. wasted thing if I did nothing, you know. Uh, but oh, most yeah. people do a music video, or they do like a newscast, or they do something along those lines—a fake movie trailer. And mm -hmm. I'm overly ambitious, and I was like, "Well, I want to do a horror film with a lot of special effects, mm -hmm. just to prove that special effects affect people." You know, as, as you know, as a filmmaker, you know, you can have a guy in old age makeup dying and it could really tug on your heartstrings you know of course or, yeah 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 or you could have somebody getting cut up and, and bloody and make you cringe you know so there's different things that can happen or jim carrey like in the mask with all this like makeup yeah. on or the grinch yeah. you know it, it can make you laugh and, and 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 giggle and all that kind of stuff so it really does makeup effects really do enhance the the, the viewing uh for the audience and yeah. i wanted to kind of prove that but make it more my style which is like yeah oh, horror and um we threw the script out because I had a couple of actors who were like, you know, I, I get it now. Back then I was like, what are you, crazy? But, you know, they it, it was a hardcore script. There was some shit in that script that I'm like, I, I found that script. And I looked back at it and I was like, I'm shocked I even wanted to make this. <laughs> I would have been canceled way back before canceling was a thing. Um, P possibly. So Possibly. I, I we threw the script out and then like we had shot 30 percent of the movie and, and you could definitely know when you watch the movie, you can be like, OK, I see what scenes because we actually tried to have it be atmospheric and all this kind of stuff. And uh, when we threw it out, I kind of gave up and was like, all right, well, let's just make a, a comedy with some horror elements and kind of spoof not only like exploitation films, but spoof like movies uh, that were coming out that were shot directly to video. And uh, that during that time, the whole YouTube craze was growing, and we were kind of spoofing stuff on there too. And uh, it it just be kind of like came like a wild movie that, yeah, had a different, you know, thing. And it's fine. I, I've come to like it now, but it wasn't like the original movie that was a dark, serious horror film, and the only comedic elements were like the mistakes in the movie. Yeah, which some of that stuff kind of carried over with this movie, but. You know, there's a difference between uh, – because we purposely made things bad. Right. Now, I'm not going to use that because I made some mistakes myself, and they're blatant in the film. Yeah. Uh, but, you know. Yeah, uh, so, I get yeah, that. We, 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 we kind of tossed it out. But the idea was, like, you know, this guy is getting bullied in school, and he's had too too much of it. Nobody's doing anything. I saw a lot of that in high school. You know, I, you know, to an yeah. extent, I was kind of bullied. I think everybody who's kind of in the arts is bullied. Oh, definitely. Th those stories are good fodder for, you know, uh, a very uh, damaged person, aren't they? Well, you know, and, and I looked at it as like what what society sees and, and, and bullying still goes on to this day. You know, I wasn't I wasn't on the other end of the stick that it was so bad where I wanted to go kill people. But like, you know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was into comedy and humor. So I would just kind of like a lot of bullies didn't like me because I would like turn it around on them and make fun of them turn them into a joke oh yeah yeah oh yeah yeah no, so, that's good well no I, I always noticed the grindhousey vibe because that was the era wasn't it was that well, that was kind of when the movie came out was when we were doing and kind of when we met um i think we met a few years before but i know that that for a lot of people the grindhouse thing that kind of came into a resurgence was a real kind of um you know a, a a real shot of adrenaline for filmmakers because like you said you could get away with some um discrepancies in terms of mistakes and things like that because you had this dark gritty rough raw vibe to it um that just was like grime all over the movie that you didn't really mind too much about the mistakes and i think you could play into that and it and, and i think it was really effective well you know uh 
there were there were a couple things that that factored into us or or, or me making that decision to do a grindhouse film and yeah. uh one of them was um i think the trailer for grindhouse came out in 06 and that was like boom yeah i want to do that i want to make that that looks like fun and uh i had already been watching a lot of the movies that were you know like we had a video store here in delaware called silver screen video where you could rent a lot of those exploitative films like zombie and cannibal holocaust and you know last house and you know the so best I would, ones yeah honestly i mean i i mean i know people are probably looking at me going like what the fuck's wrong with you but like they they really are like some of the best horror films you yeah. know if you want to be scared and grossed out uh, yeah you know morally some of the things that went on in those films it's like eh, teetering but um dude I, I just to cut in quickly i remember when when i found um out that basically vipco had all these releases and they were incredibly cheap and it was this label for these um old often video nasty band movies and there was stuff like spookies um obviously the zombie flesh eaters there was flesh eater aka zombie nosh and um uh, cannibal holocaust uh cannibal ferox that there was so many of them and and oh uh, the uh like the beyond and films like that and i remember just watching them kind of back to back like wow what have i missed like this is unbelievable and it was like it's just a whole other world it's like real horror you know oh oh yeah i mean like i i i was lucky enough to have a video store that stocked all that stuff and you know I would rent, you know, I would rent fun things like Waxwork or, you know, yeah. uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, you know, mm. but I, I would also come across like, because, you know, as you know, when you were in the video store, it was a tough decision picking a movie because all you had was the cover and the yeah. back synopsis. And at that yeah. point, I was too young to read. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <Still> kidding. <laughs> um, so, no. I, um, you know, it, it's like, huh, do I pick this or do I pick this? Mm. And normally what made the decision was like the, 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 the poster. It's like, well, this looks cool. Yeah. I remember getting Day of the Dead for the first time. Yeah. And it scared the shit out of me that I couldn't yeah, finish yeah. the movie, you know, and then somehow that effective. my favorite zombie movie. Mm. Yeah, that is definitely one of the most effective ones. Um, just the gore. I mean. When you watch Day, uh, uh, Dawn of the Dead, you're like, wow, what a gory ride. But then you watch Day of the Dead, and you're like, holy shit, this is this is getting really serious. I love it. I saw Day before I saw Dawn. And I was just kind of like, and it was the cut version, too. It was not uncut. Uh, yeah. And it still scared me. Um, it's still good, though. It's still good. I mean, uh, that's the thing about those movies. Like, I, I've got one of those box sets with all the different cuts of Dawn of the Dead. And they're all great. I love watching them all. I like that there isn't a bad cut because like it's just it's all there. You know what I mean? It's just fantastic. No, it, it, it's great because uh, I, I have that that box set as well. And it, it's like, yeah, you know, you get to see a different side of Dawn that, you know, yeah. normally we wouldn't have gotten to see, you know. No, um, totally, totally. Listen, so about your movie, one thing I have to say is it, that, that you've never really mentioned to me as far as I know, but when I looked at it and, and and the bits you showed me and the bits I've seen, I get the vibe, of course, the Grindhouse thing, but I also get a vibe that it's like, it, it's a body horror movie in a sense. Because and there's a little bit of, um, yeah, there's a little bit of um, reanimator in there and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, let me answer the last question. I didn't really, we, we kind of jumped off on like five different things from the last question. I forgot to answer that. Well, like, did we why? go on? You go for it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cause that was probably me. No, no, it's fresh in my head. I just like, oh, I want to, I want to. Um, so making it a grindhouse aesthetic was. Oh, yeah. We had no money. So I saw the trailer. I was like, I want to do something like that. And then I tried to raise money to get gear to make the picture look better. Because I yeah. was using really cheap CCD, one CCD camcorders. Um me and Ben did some test footage and we were like, you know what? This might actually work in our favor if yeah. we make it with this crude equipment because it kind of would still be grainy and scratchy. Hold on a second. It would, have, it, it would have the aesthetic, wouldn't it? It would have the correct vibe. More so than being too polished. And after that, I was sold. So we, we did. We used a PVGS-19 camcorder 
And then when that broke, which we went through camcorders, we used other things. But, you know, it also gave me the opportunity to not only pay homage to a lot of the other horror films that I've grown to love, but it, it, it could help me as an amateur filmmaker kind of make an excuse for a few mistakes. Now, like I said, we we spent a lot of time coming up with gags and like purposely fucking with the continuity. Like that was one thing we were like, we want to, that's where we wanted to have fun with it. Like continuity be damned. Like I remember there was a scene uh, where I had pens that kept changing pockets and in, and there's a scene where a guy's wearing a hat and then it changes. And it's like, those were the things that we noticed in like movies from like the seventies and eighties that yeah. we were like, let's kind of do that. And, and yeah. that's going to be yeah. our touchstone. That's what's going to be funny. Yeah. The rest of the movie is going to be dead serious dead and serious. very brutal. This is what's going to be funny. And like, you know, different editing techniques and like, you know, there's a scene where a guy just appears or, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Um, you know, uh, green screen poorly being keyed out or not even keyed yeah. out at all. I've seen that in a couple of movies. So, you know, those yeah. were the things we watched a lot of Larry Cohen films and, and like, you know, we're kind of like, okay, they did this, they did that. And, a lot of things that were shown on Mystery Science Theater, and we would like make lists. And I remember one night, me and Ben were like up all night, just giggling and laughing about. We wanted to do a scene where it's foggy, and then for a quick second, when somebody walks in, you see a guy spraying a fog machine, and then it gets cut out. <laughs> just because it was like, well, fuck, we got it. We have I to pat that. it out somehow, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I do like the idea that you said there, where you're gonna have those are going to be the laughs with the quote unquote mistakes, but everything else is going to be played dead serious. And I think that's so clever because I've seen, obviously we've all seen a lot of like comedy horror and stuff like that. And the biggest problem is when everything is too funny, some things you have to play it straight. You have to keep it straight. Um, that's why I love Shaun of the Dead because all of the horror and the zombie stuff is played really straight and quite scary in places like the makeup's great and everything, but the comedic parts, they come in and they just get you in the right time. Obviously, this isn't meant to be as funny as that, but um, I think that's a good approach to go for because those are like little treats for the audience. They can go, oh, yeah, I saw that, you know. But when we threw the script out, it kind of took on this weird comedy that was not intentional. It, it just mm. because I was up every single night writing, you know, trying to take the 30 percent that was serious and try to make something that made sense. And yeah. When, because of that, because we threw a script out and I was writing, we ended up shooting too much. Right. And it was hard to kind of make it make sense. But, you know, it's still, you know, I'm look, I, I'm aware it's not a great movie, but I also know it's not a bad movie. You know, I, I think it's, you know, amongst bad movies, it, it, it has its place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I, I, it took me years to come to the conclusion that, hey, don't be embarrassed by this. Put this fucking thing out because you were a teenager and you made a movie. Yeah. And Which there's is rare. Some, there's something to be said to, to finish something. Absolutely. This it's movie, all about finishing things. Definitely. It's been in the can for about almost 10 years now. Like we, mm. we, we shot it all from like, we, we, we got test footage from 2007, 2006 is when we started doing some test footage. Nothing that we used it in the film, but it wasn't, it was just like, him and the uh, Ben in the outfit in the in the uh, uh, lab coat, cutting up these prosthetic uh, body parts that I made, and um, then we actually started shooting death scenes, and and just to, like I think the first death scene we shot was the beginning of the movie just to see if it'll work, and once we were like okay this will work it cuts together, uh, we started shooting fake trailers, right, and then we started shooting the rest of the the deaths. And the right, rest right, of the right. serious scenes. And then after that, we we had a couple of the actors come up and go, Will, my parents will kill me if they see this movie. Like, they'll disown me. I love it. Yeah. It That's was, a it compliment. Was, well, you know what? It, it was, you know, we, we did a lot of politically incorrect things in that script. Uh, the violence was very, very hardcore. Mm. And there's like one scene in that movie. And, you know, it, it was, it was uh, because what he, what he is, is he, he, takes these people that picked on him and he tries to do these backyard surgeries on them. And yeah. one of them was an abortion to this pregnant yeah. girl that gets pregnant from a jock that, and they both picked on him. Yeah. And he's like, look, I can fix this. And I love it. 
I'm glad we didn't do it, you know, because it, it would have just ruined. It's almost like Sam Raimi with the Evil Dead with the the the, the exactly. That's you know what, what I, mean? I was thinking. Yeah, it, yeah. It, th there are moments when it's you're like, whoa, whoa they're really going there. But almost um, there's a bit of trauma esque vibe in there as well, you know, because they've gone to some levels where you're like, no way, are they really doing that? But it, it almost is so comical in a sense that you go, all right, I'll let them get away with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. I, I, you know, I was trying to make a very gory and serious film that made you more so question who your neighbors were. You know, like me, who's the person right. sitting next to you? And I think, I, like I, I think, like I said, when you watch it, you can kind of see. And then we also did some weird editing things where, like, we try to make it feel like you were in a theater. So there's like a projector kind of running in the background, just very faintly. And then, that's like, cool. you know, the bottom of the screen goes to the top of the screen once or twice. And there's like a missing frame. Of course that was ha happening grindhouse, but um, yeah. it was oh, just cool. We, we had a lot of fun making it. So it's like, you know, I'm not as embarrassed by it now. And especially with what we're doing with all the DVD release and the Blu-ray release, which you know, the first time it's ever been released. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a better pill to swallow. If this was just a bare bones DVD with just this movie, I don't think anybody would buy it, but I hope with the documentary and what we're doing here, uh, people enjoy it. <laughs> You know, so back to the body horror question. So, yeah, sorry, I got excited, I think. And I, uh, yeah, you know, Mr. Editor might have to help us out there. But yeah, no, just I just wondered if you got if, if that was in your mind, whether it just happened that way or if there was any, you know, Stuart Gordon influence going on. So for the character of Haywood West, yeah, it was definitely an, a reanimator influence. But the main uh, influence for the look of Haywood was uh Dr. Frankenstein from Day of the Dead, because he was always covered in blood. Yeah. And uh, I got that. I got that. That's great. When, when we decided to make it more so a comedy, it was kind of like, I think it'll be funny if we just had him covered in blood and nobody really notices that he's the killer. Like, that's the kind of stuff I was thinking of. And it, it's like, yeah. it is funny, in my opinion, but like, yeah. it's still like a strike. You know, I, I really wanted to make this guy, because look, I, I went to school film school where people were wearing berets and smoking clove cigarettes so people kind of get into the <laughs> the whole you know a persona of being a filmmaker and it's the same thing yeah, with a, a kid course. really end up being a med student you know really wanting to be mm. a doctor you know um yeah but yeah. he wouldn't be covered in blood you know he, he would try to cover his tracks the best he could right. so, yeah um that yeah. was one thing but the, no haywood west was definitely uh, inspired by herbert west and I think in the original script, he was trying to make like a, a Jeffrey Dahmer-esque zombie uh, to see if he could do it, you know, to see right. if it would like, you know, you know. So it was kind of like a, a half zombie movie. And we threw that out the window. Um, right, right. Too, too much going on. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You've got to be a bit careful, haven't you? Because um, there's a lot to be said for writing a very rich script, but also... I think some movies, and you see it all the time, they fall foul and you're watching, you go, this is great, but there's so much going on here and I'm kind of overwhelmed. And then you struggle to enjoy the really good bits and blah, 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 blah. But um, I well, think every movie that you make, it has to go through a few incarnations of what it should be, you know? I, I think the original script was definitely more cohesive. It had a beginning, middle, and end in a plot. Whereas this right. film, I struggled with the rewrites to try to like, you know, I, I remember somebody asking me, like, why didn't you just take the original script and just cut that stuff out? And it was just right. like, well, because it was it was peppered with a bunch of fucked up shit, man. It's like it, I, I think as a kid, as a novice writer, like, first off, I wasn't a very good writer back then, but I tried, you know, uh, yeah. the formatting was like very different. It wasn't like your typical screenplay format. Like I was I'm, the same. Yeah, it was just like a word document with like here's this, and it, it looked more yeah. like a like I don't know like a like a play I guess I don't know how how to yeah, explain. um, but it 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 worked. People understood it. I worked with a good crew that kind of like you know knew like how it went. Yeah. Um, but you know if if I were to if anybody were to ever remake it, I would love for them to revisit that original script because I think that's the kind of film. Remember, when I wrote this, the audiences at that time were watching movies like Hostel, High Tension, yeah, and The Hills Have Eyes remake. And yeah. I, I felt like this is a very appropriate movie at the time. Absolutely. And uh, there was no way I could make it as cool and crisp as those movies due to my, you know, I didn't have fucking gear. I didn't have money. 
Um, no, of course. Just a course. bunch of kids in their backyards making a fucking movie. But I still think it would have been right up there uh, gore-wise if I had done it right. Now, here's another thing. As I was making this movie, we were purposely doing things on bad. Um, the movie went on so long that I had gone to film school, become an actual, in my opinion, a decent filmmaker as I was making this. So I was kind of like throwing everything out the window that I learned. And I was, it, it really did affect me. Like I was like, fuck, what am I doing? I should just scrap this whole fucking thing and make a real movie, you know? But we are at that point had already shot so much of that movie and I just wanted to make it work. Like I said, so yeah. many people worked so hard on this movie. And I think I disappointed a lot of them when I was like, I don't want to release it. I'm embarrassed by it. Because I felt people, when they watch this movie, would judge me. Right. Especially now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is, it is a, it's a bold move to do. Not so much in the grand scheme of the universe, but in your own mind. It's ballsy when you've sat on something for so long. I mean, I've got old projects that, uh, I mean, they're out there, but I definitely don't tell people where they are. Because, to be honest with you, if I could burn them, I probably would. Um, but I think there's something to be said, A, for like finishing a project, which is such a rare thing. Um, and to go back and revisit it and release it properly, I think really it's, it's a good sense of closure for yourself as a filmmaker. So obviously when you go back to revisit an old project and, you know, we've all got our, our opinions on our old work. And like I said, there's stuff of mine. I, I watch it and I just want to die when I watch it. But being honest, what what is the most kind of effective part of the movie that you go, you know what, I did a fucking good job there and I probably wouldn't change that part. Obviously, there's tons of things you probably would change. But what do you actually feel like, wow, I really nailed that part. Just forget everything else that may have not worked in my mind or whatever. Uh, casting Ben. Casting Ben, Josh and Adam. I think that was the, the best decision I could have made. I mean, Ben... When you have a character like that that starts off as a super serious character and then becomes a caricature of – like he played yeah. it so straight that right. at times he is kind of scary. That makes sense? Yeah, no, totally. But like – when Josh and Adam were cast, like they – you know, they, they played the serious parts fine. But once it became a comedy, they played that even better. And it really helped sell that aspect of the film. I couldn't right. have done that without them. Right, right. Well, that's not an easy character arc to do, is it, really? Because um, a little bit like, um, you know, in The Shining, any character, it's when you've got to go through an extreme change, it's tough to do. And to pull it off, to make it effective and humorous and scary at the same time, um, I think it is good to have a keen eye for the right actors. And obviously, you knew them pretty well. And, and what was it like working with them um, and you know, um, back then, maybe the director that you were versus who you are now, what was the experience like? Really getting into the, I'm directing the actors side of it. Um, well, the one of the reasons I chose them was because they were free. <laughs> of course. But, Very uh, important. no, they were, they were friends of mine. And I think the thing that I really appreciated was when I came up with the project and I kind of pitched it to them because I kept it kind of secret, like for a while. I, I originally for the for the project, like I I wanted to do like a Dr. Seuss movie. I wanted to do something whimsical with miniatures and character makeups and like right. make it but I still wanted them involved. Yeah. Um, when I found out that that was gonna be way too much money and way too much work, I kind of was like, Okay, downsize it and let's um Yeah do do what we what were this, you know. And yeah. um I always had them in mind and when they kind of agreed to it, I really enjoyed working with them because it was like Ben, like if I was on camera and Ben was acting, it, it was kind of like he knew it was like an unwritten thing. Like I know what to do. And the same thing, vice versa. When I was on camera, like acting and he was using the camera, mm -hmm. um, he knew exactly the shots to get. And yeah. Josh and Adam were kind of the same way. Well, that's chemistry, isn't it, really? That's good chemistry between all of you that really makes that up, I think. Yeah, and, and like, look, you know, I know they got irritated. I know everybody got irritated near the end because we were shooting this movie for, like, I think, like I said, we started shooting test stuff in 06, 
we didn't finish shooting the movie until like 2011, 2012, I want to say. I mean, like the bulk of the movie. I'm not talking about yeah. like anything. Like, you know, I did some, I shot some weird shit for like the intro credits with blood squirting and stuff like that, you know. That, you yeah. know, but that that was something that I really uh, appreciated from them was they they stuck with it even though they didn't have to. They could have yeah. easily told me, hey, go fuck yourself. I think they did a couple of times. Like, I know there were times where they, they came over and they didn't really want to work on the movie. And I was trying to trick them to work on the movie because I just wanted to get it done. You know, when you yeah. sink your whole life into into something and, and, and money, yeah. Yeah. you're the only one that really cares about it. To them, it's kind of like, oh, this is this is fun. I'm just going to have a, a, a blast doing it. And they did. Uh, but it was still very stressful for me. You know what I mean? And I I. I I think I wish I could have enjoyed it more. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I didn't enjoy it as much. I was so stressed about like, well, I hope this effect turns out well. And I, you know, I hadn't even gone to the Savini school when we shot most of those practical effects. I was like still working out of my bedroom with yeah. shit. Like I didn't even know how to sculpt. Like I, I tried, I didn't know how to mold make either. Like I, I fucked up a lot of prosthetics, but we still use them. You know, somehow it, it just kind of worked, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like that. And I'm, I'm sure you had that grindhouse aesthetic was was working in your favor, especially with the effects. It does help, you know. But I thought the effects from what you showed me looked great, c considering the time it was made, where you were at in your kind of filmmaking journey and that. We had a saying on set, like when things didn't work out, uh, fuck it, it's grindhouse. You know, that's what we would say. Just... Yeah. And at first yeah. it became like a, it was like a joke. We'd be like, Hey, fuck it. It's grindhouse. And then it became more of a defeated, like, you know, Ben yeah. talking to me and saying, I understand. Like, hey, we don't have sound equipment today. Ah, oh, fuck it. It's grindhouse. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. but, um, <laughs> let me ask you this. I want to ask you something like, what were your thoughts when you were seeing me make this? Cause I was posting stuff all over Facebook and MySpace. Uh, yeah. About it. What were your initial thoughts when you first started seeing and learning about this? Well, I mean, I just love the dedication and it was very obvious and apparent that you're incredibly passionate about the project. You're dedicated. You know, you see people post about these things and they all go through the same. You know, there's, all, there's always different types of people. Some people are desperate just to get it seen and get it out there, but they may not be passionate personally about the project. They're just trying to get a clout. Um, or they're part of a project that they're very desperate that is going to become successful so it goes well for them. But with you, and, and like other people I see that are really into it and know their stuff, you were just so kind of like gung-ho about it and you were always working on it, you are always posting about it. And I just got the vibe that like this is this is definitely your movie and it's it, this is the most important thing in your life at that time, which is what filmmakers that's what we're like that's how it should be i mean a lot of people will probably lie about that and go no i mean i i had lots going on you know but in reality i know when i'm making a movie and i've and i've solidified that this is going to be like the movie that's going to come out or whatever um a lot of other things in my life tend to blur you know and it, and it can it can get to desperation sometimes but the passion was always there and you know, it was obvious. So I got to see a, a glimpse of how important it was to you. And I think that was the thing that came across, you know, the most. Well, I, I appreciate that because I was always watching what you were doing and you seemed like you had a movie every week, man. I was like, man, this guy's really working, really hustling. So thank I you started a movie every into week. Two filmmakers wanking each other off. This is been... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Down boy. No, I started a movie every other week. That's the difference, you know. But no, I, I definitely fell into a bit of a a bit of a trap that I put myself in where I was like, oh, wow, I can do this. I'm a filmmaker. Let's just go wild and that was a big mistake so i learned the hard way um you know a fair few times i should have calmed down a bit but i was busy but you know <laughs> what though i'll tell you this this is the thing that really impressed me about you whereas i struggled with you actually released your movies like you made multiple movies and released them whereas i made this and a bunch of short stuff or you know after this i made a bunch of like sizzle reels to try to get work as a director because i was like i'm not yeah. gonna release macabre medicine nobody's ever gonna hire me they're gonna look at this and be like the fuck is this you know it's like so it's like you actually release stuff whereas i sat on this for i don't know fucking almost 20 years you know it felt like you know yeah um, yeah so well, you know, hey i released stuff and they got it and went what the fuck is this I threw it away no i'm kidding oh, uh, well sort of only i no, said you know, that 
<laughs> That's true. No, the thing is, you, there's a middle ground here. There's 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 a, a pros and cons thing. So you could say, hey, you know, this guy over here hasn't released a film, or hasn't got a film out yet, or or the big film he's worked on is not released. But then this guy has, has released so many, blah blah blah, whatever X amount. I think, I think there's a there's a smart approach in playing your cards right and maybe not thinking that, that um, the uh, the public deserve everything that you've got to give. I think that's a trap I fell into again where I was like, I just wanted to be a filmmaker and I understood the business side enough to know that I could probably make a few bucks if I played it right. But in hindsight, looking back, I would shave a couple of those titles and they would probably be available, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have like pushed to release them in the way that I did. Because probably looking back objectively, I'm like, maybe shouldn't have done that one. Maybe should have. You know what I mean? So I think that I, I think you have to be smart. I think, yes, there is a lot to be said about someone who gets things done and gets them out there. But at the same time, it's good to um, play your cards right and place your bets. And, and, and really, you know, if you have to sit on something for a long time until it's, it, it's the, the product that you want, that you think represents you then so be it, you know, it's, it's a struggle, you know, it's an ongoing thing, but, um, I never struggled to get stuff out there, but it was far from what I hoped it would be. Do you know what I mean? And, and the projects that took longer to get out there and the ones that have really been a labor of love in recent years, they've been more like the projects I really wanted to release, but they had a lot more care over them. You know, that, that's all I can say, but you know what it's like, we were young, we just, Ah, I want to do I, it. You know? I didn't know any better when I was making it. It was just kind of like, all right, we're going to do Same. something. And I'm going to, I'm going to do dangerous shit that I, nobody should ever do. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I used to have regrets on it. I used to be like, you know, cause I, I beat myself up over a lot of stuff, you know? And with this one, it was kind of like, I really wanted to make a good film. And I don't know how, why, you know, it, it didn't turn out, you know, it's what's funny is we had a lot of uh, screenings of the film, like to different people that I knew. And I think that really kind of dictated the edit. There was at one point the movie was a, was at three hours. Wow. Yeah, because we just kept shooting. And I just kept yeah. like I had this long I was I wasn't even using like a really amazing editing software. I was using something called Pinnacle. It was okay for the time, but it was very I, limited. Yeah, I remember it. I used Pinnacle for a couple of years. And like you said, it was okay, but it, it was so limited. And it for me, it didn't work great. It was very laggy. Well, and, and like the, the, the timeline, like, well, first off, the computer I had was state of the art, but it was, not, it was still not good enough. And the timeline I had, it was just kept getting bigger and bigger and oh. bigger and bigger. And then what I would do is I was I would export the movie out because you only had so many like tracks for sound effects and stuff. Mm. Would export it out as an AVI, right? And then put it back in the editor, and then cut it and do more stuff with it. And it Just to it, help with a bit of CPU, yeah. I, I I've done that before. Well, and then with that, with the edit we have now, you have like thirty different codec, you know, of of DV on this movie, yeah. and it's yeah. just like it's almost like it, the it's, camera. It's a, it's a real problem, and a lot of people you know don't really think about that i mean i've done a lot of editing on documentaries which are a nightmare because there's so much there's so many different sources of the material especially a couple um that i worked on where they shot stuff all across the world and i'm dealing with all this different footage and all this stuff and and then suddenly the timeline freezes and then i've got to locate the clip that's fucking everything up and it's a nightmare. So often I will go in and just re-encode everything into one AVI. So at least then I can go in with a clear head. And you know what I mean? Even now on, on the stuff these days, codecs can still really, you know, screw you over. Not to mention that we had multiple hard drive failures while making this movie. Like files, there are files from Akkad Medicine. Like I remember I had the first hard drive I got for this movie it was a little purple hard drive and I was at Josh Lynch's house and we were editing something and it was sitting on a table that a mutual friend of ours made and the table was rickety as shit and it fell. The table wasn't even that high. It was like two foot. It oh falls, lands on the ground. Just We plugged it in. Oh no. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we took it to the school. I'm getting like, sweaty thinking about it. Oh, and we had a lot. And I mean, luckily I had some of that stuff. Not, I wouldn't say backed up. I didn't know what backed up was, but I had it on my computer. Me neither. But there was a lot of early footage, early test shit of Ben that we, you know, we lit it to hell. And we didn't, have, you know, how it was. We had like industrial work lights. We couldn't afford light. Like shit's so much cheaper today. But we I had know. like no gear, but we lit it a certain way and had fog going through. It was very atmospheric and a very different movie. And those files are lost forever. And then, yeah. you know, when I was working on this stuff in PA, uh, we had a couple corrupt files on a hard drive. The, the hard drive didn't go berserk. The files did, right? Oh. So we had like three files on that hard drive that were just like, boom, done, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's like there's parts of Macabre Medicine that re we shot to help tie this movie together that it, they're gone. You yeah. know, and, and there's other things that have happened too. you know, cameras that died, you know, mm -hmm. and tons of other shit. And like, you know, and, and recently it wasn't until like a couple months ago, I was digitizing tapes and I found tapes that I've never seen before that we shot of Macabre Medicine. And I'm like, well, what? Holy shit. Like, what do I do with this? Yeah, do I cut it? Yeah. Do I insert it in the movie? And I was like, no, I'll, just, I'll cut it, but I'll put it as a, a special feature. So there's right. a lot of stuff that I found on tape that we were lucky to have, but I don't have any recollection of shooting it. I've been there, and I've definitely been there before with the whole file problem because it's just it's devastating because you, you, you're trying to figure out the root of the problem and when the file itself is corrupted you just think i've not touched this in years what possibly could have gone wrong with it but it it ain't having it when, when people ask me they're like how much money did you spend on this movie and it was fifteen thousand dollars and it's like where did you get the money we tried to fundraise nobody would give us any money and uh you know i did the whole going to doctors lawyers and dentists at the end of the year for a tax write-off thing and uh, nobody did it. So I took money out of my savings and whatever money I was getting out of my paycheck, I was working a job and I funded this movie. And like most of the money went towards I, I fed the crew, I got them food, drinks, uh, DV tape stock. Because I at one point I was like, I can't keep taping over these tapes. I might want to save these for later. Thank God. Of course. And those were expensive. You know, I think for a set of three, they were like 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, the special effects and blood. But also, you know, getting a hard drive fixed costs money. Luckily, I had friends that did it for free, but I did pay a couple people to fix computers and hard drives over the years. Mm. And, you know, uh, fixing laptops and getting my computer fixed and trying to send the cameras away to get them fixed. And it was just a huge thing that costs money after a while. Mm. And plus, not to mention, like, we went through so much blood in certain scenes that, like, you know, I was just carrying gallon upon gallon. Like, you know, I would have these two liter soda bottles just filled with blood in the back of my trunk. And, you know, there were a couple scenes where we would just throw blood everywhere. You know, there yeah. was blood. I remember there was one scene out in the forest we shot where we were actually up to our ankles in blood because there was so much blood. I love that. I love that. Did you get any in the camera? That's the question. Always. That always happens. It, it's like as much as you try to keep the blood away from the camera, um, I think on an old movie, we had one that got completely messed up, got totally broken. And uh, we couldn't figure out what the problem was. And a friend of ours managed to take it apart just to see, have a little look inside. And there was all blood in there. And I thought, no way. How? You know what I mean? But it gets everywhere. It gets everywhere. You know, now that I have expensive gear, it's like I, I handle effects and blood a lot differently. Back then, it Same. was like the wild west you know yeah i yeah. really didn't care because it like to me you know you're using well back then it was a lot of money because i was a broke student but like you had a mini dv camcorder and like those things were kind of they weren't indestructible but they they definitely took a, a beating and, like yeah. we've dropped it we threw it at, like you know just to get shots and yeah um yeah the, the heads would get really dirty because blood would seep in and you know we weren't thinking about making a pexiglass bl uh, box or using like we did use a i think a trash bag and it didn't work out well but like we weren't thinking about those things we were just trying no. to get the shot you know so yeah we yeah. we went through uh they're actually behind me um <laughs> one two three four five, like five cameras love it love it that's great 
it's good to keep all those things because I love look, looking back at that stuff. Like I, I think I said to you, I've been trying to find that camera. I actually I did I did see one in a shop, but it was the, the first camera I ever had. I can't remember the, the model. Um, I tried to remember, but it's weird. I just remember seeing it in a shop, and I was like, "That's it. That's the one." You know what I mean? It's like when you see an old friend. I was like, "Whoa, there what, it is." You know? Do you remember your first time editing on a computer? <laughs> yeah just about it was weird because <laughs> i was using it's hard work i was using a vcr two tape decks and i had this device that you could add sound effects and music but it would get rid of your 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 audio track oh yeah love that so, so like i would film my computer i would go into movie maker because i didn't i didn't have any hook i didn't have a computer that could do video editing i would film right. like a, a title that i made on video Sometimes I'd have a boom box in the background playing music and I would start and stop it. Love that. And then that's, like, that's similar to what we did. Yeah. I think that's how you got to do it. Isn't you? Well, as I got more advanced, you know, I, I was finding things and buying things and trying stuff. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I tell kids today, like who are trying to make movies. I'm like, look, you know, you've got a cell phone that can shoot better footage than anything that we could have ever dreamed of it's, back when we were so playing. true. And it's like, crazy. But even tripods and lighting. Like I remember I wanted to buy a set of RE lights and they were like 10 grand. I know. For three lights. I'm like, well, I can't afford that. I remember yeah. buying makeup. Makeup was expensive. Like mm -hmm. to get latex. You, yeah. you, you know, you, you either waited until Halloween came to Rite Aid and then Halloween, you know, the day after Halloween, everything went on sale, 50% off, 75% off. And you yeah. stocked up from there, which is what yeah. I used to do. Or you went to Monster Makers and you bought a gallon of liquid latex. Serious like money, yeah. 50 bucks, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the amazing thing about the time we're in at the minute, um, it's good and bad, but we're definitely in a very prosumer kind of world. And that has bridged the gap, I think. And that is where the, the, everything seems to be like, hey, we want anyone to make a movie. So, so many like industry things where you would go, well, I need to go to an industry guy to get that and I'm going to pay an industry price. I mean, I remember um, years ago, funny enough, when I was putting a, trying to put a movie out, um, I needed to create an uh, M&E track. And at the time, I didn't know how to do that. Um, and they needed it on DigiBeta. So I called up this guy in New York because he was apparently the guy. And, and the price was fucking ridiculous. I was like, I'm done. I can't do this. There's no way I could do this. It was, it was, I can't even remember what it was, but it was like in the thousands, which back then was just like, no, I, I what am I going to do? Do you know what I mean? Um, but now all those things, you could probably do that on your phone. Do you know what I mean? That, that all that stuff, it, it's, it's nuts. I mean, I think it's made filmmaking more accessible, um, for the right people. Um, I think it's tougher on quality control these days, but, it's nice to see so many people going out there and making their movies and, and not ruining their lives, making themselves so broke just to get a film done, you know? You know, it, it blows my mind. It's just like, I remember, like I said, things have changed so much where you can get lights so much more affordable now and, you know, tripods. Or, I remember just to get a decent fluid head tripod was expensive. And now, yeah, you know, they're almost giving them away, you know? It's it's insane. Like I it see is these, insane. these cats running around nowadays, they're shooting on these uh, gimbals. And I remember when I got my first Steadicam and it was like, that was expensive. And it wasn't yeah. even like, I didn't even have the vest. And it was just like, a, it was called a Steadicam smoothie. It mm. was just really, you know, it was meant for like DSLRs or camcorders and well, camcorders really didn't even need like a, a Steadicam. They had that built in no. iOS that kind of worked for what it, what you needed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those gimbals are unbelievable. And when you look at the gear and the setups that, um, you used to have, you know, especially on bigger cameras, the rigs and everything that were just so ridiculous. You look at it, you think that's back breaking work. Now, the little gimbal, because obviously the quality and the power of a giant camera that you would need to necessitate something like that is now shrunk down. I mean, thank God for uh, uh, mirrorless and DSLR. So obviously you're limiting the amount of weight to a few grams and then you got, you know, the gimbal. It's unbelievable. I mean, have you tried one of those um, in recent times? One of the, um, what do they call it? Is it the Ronin? Is it I haven't tried the, I, I like have that. like a Ziyun. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I don't like it because like, no. I, even, I have a DJI one. 
for the phone and like it constantly glitches and i just i right. you know I, when, when you're on like if you're doing like you know commercial work or you're doing something for a client where it's like i'm going to shoot a video or a wedding or something you don't really have time for shit to fuck up you know so it's like you know i i can i can get the same thing with a camera with ios on it and uh you know uh, monopod and just kind of run and gun it you know because you don't yeah. you don't want to miss a shot and no, of course you know maybe it's just me not knowing how to use the shit but like you know i uh i, I don't know i'm such a curmudgeon and i let me tell you something when i was young i didn't have a tripod for the first four or five years that i made films i put a camera in a tree that's how i did it i didn't or i stacked books up and put it on there like, you know, so it's like, you know, and, yeah. I, and that's where I think even though today this shit is more expensive than it's ever been, the ingenuity is gone because we couldn't afford a slide. We didn't have sliders when we were kids. No, it's true. It's true. We had to use, I, I, what we did was we put it on a like a mouse pad or a, a, a piece of like cloth and moved it, you know, yeah. on a yeah. flat surface. That's how we did it. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember using a um, uh, silk or satin bed bedspread because you know you know it just slides all over the place and uh, at one time we had two blocks of wood um between like two ladders or something like that and a skateboard even that was tough you know and it, it's it but it is crazy all, all these um diy methods and i do think a bit of the fun of like how can we cobble this together like you said it has gone a little bit because everything is so accessible i i i love having things to hand and i love the filmmaking world that i'm in right now not necessarily, I'm not talking about films that are made, but for me personally, the world, the way it functions and everything I can get hold of, I love that. But I still love to kind of reminisce and I still love the days when I'm really up against it and I'm like, wow, how are we going to do this? And something clicks in your head and you're like, yes, you know what I mean? Those are the fun times. And I'm sure you had many moments like that on Macar Medicine for sure. Well, yeah, that was like, you know, I always tell people Makai Medicine was my film school before film school. I learned a lot of what not to do, a lot of uh, trial and error, like trying things out, mostly with effects. And dude, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm shocked half that shit got pulled off the way that it did, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some mistakes that we made, like there's lighting in the shot because I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just like, because it wasn't like we had like a script supervisor or even a DP. It was just like usually me and Ben shooting yeah. it. And then quickly throwing a light up and being like, oh, I hope we yeah. get this. Well, I, you know, the amount of times on set back in the day, I think the most uttered phrase was um, we go back, we check the, the monitor, we go, that actually looks all right. Like, like, wow, we were shocked that we actually pulled it off, you know, because it's hard. It's tough. I mean, we didn't even have a monitor. We were just playing it back from the camcorder being like and looking. And it's like a, it's a small three inch screen and being like, all right, that'll do. Let's move on, you know. And like we we didn't even check the dailies until like after the shoot. And that's where I would so I would go back and just digitize the footage and throw it in the editor and then try to cut yeah. the sequence together that night. Yeah. And it was a lot of me like going, Oh fuck, how like Josh has this famous quote, like I was like, What what did you think when we were shooting it? And he goes, I was wondering how it was going to cut together. Because he goes, You you were like a kid with ADHD running around shooting this thing. And somehow we magically pulled it off because I think in my head I knew what I wanted. I just needed to get in that zone yeah. and get it. Yeah, yeah. You know? It, well, you know what? It blows my mind to think about filmmakers and shooters, shall we say, that don't edit because obviously I understand it. It's it's a it's a thing. But for me personally, I most of the stuff I edit really, or, or shall I say, what I'm shooting, I plan to edit it. So I've always got that idea in my head. So. Like you said, yeah, I, I can understand that you, to everyone else, you'd be like, wow, he's filming way too much. But in your head, you're like, I know how we can use this. And B-roll is a wonderful thing. It is good to have two, like plenty of footage. Obviously, it's worse to not have enough, but sometimes it can be scary when you're looking at all those clips. Like, what am I going to do with all this? You know? Hold on, let me... Uh... No, I won't hold on. Don't you ever make me wait. Because I, I actually have a good point I want to bring up about how I shot this movie. I just would hit record once and just keep the camera rolling. And that's how we got so much behind the scenes footage. Right. Oh, I see. That's so right. I would and what I would do is I, I call I think I call it like move and groove is how like what we were calling it on set. Um, like run and gun. 
Yeah, it, it was like I hit record and then I would just get as many shots. And you, the cool thing is about that, I would never do it today. But looking back at it, it's cool seeing me trying to figure out how to do something. Yeah. Piecing it together as I'm shooting. Because, you know, I was very young. I didn't know what I was doing. And um, yeah. I thought that was kind of like the ingenuity of how I pulled things off. Like, I don't remember a lot of, of stuff. I remember I remember the important things. Like, there's some funny stories that I have about being on this movie. But I don't remember, like, the in-between the frames. You know what I mean? I remember, like, the bad shit that went wrong or the goofy yeah. shit that happened or the good times. Yeah. I don't remember, like, okay, you know, we killed somebody. What happened in between that, you know? No, I know. I think a lot of that becomes a blur. For me, personally, um, sometimes I, I'm in a bit of a weird zone. And, I, and I'll go back and watch footage, like, raw footage. And there'll be a conversation. I'll be like, when did we say that? Like, I genuinely, or, or, you know, I'll listen to myself speak to another actor. And I'll be like, wow, I sounded like a right dick then. You know, just because I think in the moment, I'm not a different guy, but I'm very much in a different zone. Um, and there aren't many experiences or situations, I, I should say, in life where I'm that much taken out of me, where I'm like, okay, this is so serious. But filming always brings it out of me. And I think that is... I think that's a director's curse in a way. Well, there's a lot of that in Makai Medicine. I, I know I probably pissed off a lot of people just by the way I was talking to them. And it's just like, yeah, that's you're young and like, say this, do it like this. It's like, no, you got to direct these fucking people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I got better as I made the movie, you know, and, and I was very like kind of closed off about certain things. Like I remember I really wanted to be secretive about certain things with this film because I was kind of paranoid about people like taking pictures and like releasing them. Like I wanted to have control yeah. over that because I had worked so hard on this thing. And yeah. like if people brought like friends on set, I would kind of get nervous and a little weirded out. Like, why are yeah. they here? We're trying to, you know, especially when you're investing your own money into it, you're like, what are they going to do? Are they here to yeah. sabotage, you know? And that's, you know, it's not the right way to look at things, but at the time of making uh, the movie, uh, that did happen. I think I pissed off one of Adam's girlfriends doing that because she was like, I'm here to help. But I'm like, no, just sit down over there. Uh, and it wasn't I wasn't trying to be rude or anything. I wasn't trying to like, you know, belittle her. I like looking back at it, I'm like, oh, fuck, I think I pissed her off. But like I was <laughs> I was trying to just kind of keep in a mental headspace. Like I have a job to do. I got to yeah. get it done. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I I know yeah. what I need to do. I don't really need any distractions. Yeah you're sort of micromanaging in a sense because y you know exactly what you need and you're like okay i don't need you to do that so don't get in you know don't get in the way of my plan you know well, not only that but like i'm not going to mention any names but when i was kind of practicing and making short films i've worked with a lot of people not a lot but a couple people who i would trust with the camera or with certain effects duties or something and they would fuck it up and we've, I, we've all I, been there I, you know, I'm very like, you know, and I think that's for a while why I was a one man band because I was like, fuck, you know, Jesus, I'm putting this money forth and it, it, this fucking effect looks like ravioli. It, it didn't look like ravioli. It looked like burnt ravioli. So uh, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. joke. But, but no, a lot of people that I worked with, you know, and people will lie to you and, and stuff like that about like, oh yeah, I was a professional cameraman or I was a professional this. And then they're not, you know, Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hired somebody to shoot a wedding with me once and they, when they were hitting record, they were actually stopping record. Oh so no. Walking around filming their foot walking. And like, this is back in the days of DV. I've done that when I was like yeah. before college, but that's something you, you kick out quickly, isn't it? I mean, geez. And I was lucky <laughs> to have another two cameras rolling on my end. So I was okay. But like, you know, you were very lucky. I, I, I was very worried about that with macabre medicine because now my own money is involved and it's not that I didn't, I didn't trust people. It's that uh, I was scared to have, something like that fuck up and then me kind of yeah. be on the line like well what do we do now i still get that fear now to be brutally honest with you there are times when whoever i trust in the situation and i obviously in the same situation you're in you're going to be the guy who's put it all together and it's your neck on the line so to speak and there's been times when still now i'm i'm you know if i'm recruiting like a cinematographer or something like that 
I'm like, I hope this guy's got the, you know, I hope he, he's 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 got the juice. He knows what he's doing because uh, I'm trusting his word with my gear, my project, and and my reputation online. Because when the movie's done, if he's fucked up, it doesn't matter. He can go off. <laughs> he can just disappear. But it's going to be my my name above the movie. So it is hard. Trust is a very difficult thing to find people that are reliable that that have your your best interests at heart and have common sense as well. Oh, and, and, and that trust you as a leader, you know, it's like with macabre medicine, I, I was very fortunate that I was a very yellow director, very amateur. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I, I had a good sense to things, but I still didn't know a lot. Like I didn't know right. what the 180 rule was. I had no fucking clue. No, I didn't either. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, and, and like, I didn't know how to really deal with actors and, you know, the, the, the behind the scenes, you know, shit talking, you know, that would happen about me. And, um, you know, I, and, and it, it did, it affected me. Cause I was like, I thought, you know, I thought we were all in this together. I thought we were making a good movie. I thought we were kind of, you know, and not everybody, I learned a lot from that. And what I learned was if you want to really alienate your friends, push your family away from you, make everybody kind of look at you weird and, kind of make yourself feel like a failure make an independent film it's so true that is so true i was i was waiting for the make a movie make a movie it, it's sad but it's true and i've been through the exact same thing people you know they they react adversely to that kind of extreme flexing of creativity don't they and 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 they don't like because when you write a project and you come out with it you're very comfortable you're like this is my project this is me this is what i'm about if if you like it i could do with the help if you don't like it then get lost and, and and people i think deep down they know they could never do that themselves i think that sometimes you know because it's such a big undertaking i i'm sure there's a lot of jealousy that goes around you know and and and, and look you know i'm not saying mckay medicine was great but i know there's a lot of other people who were kind of looking at me when i was making that movie and going like what is he bragging about and it's like you really you know it's not that i was bragging but you really have to believe in everything you're doing because if you don't believe sure. in it nobody else will that's and true. I yeah. really believe that I was not I wouldn't say making a good film. I, I kind of knew where we were. And and <laughs> this is a fucked up thing that we did. But me and Ben. Ben, I got interviewed a lot for this movie on like different sites and stuff. And Ben was like, you love Andy Kaufman and you love Norm Macdonald. You should create this character, this persona of the pretentious filmmaker. <laughs> And I did. And I I was like this prick. And I remember <laughs> I remember like just being like, oh, can I say fuck more? Hey, what's going on with this? And yeah, talking shit. Like, I don't know if you know this. I'm a huge fucking Romero fan. Like huge. But like I remember I did an interview. I was like, yeah, Romero's the worst director in the world. Just because I wanted to come off as a prick. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I, I know the real you would never say that. I'm like, come on, man. Romero. But yeah, no, well, and, and it's like, it's funny because I like a lot of people called me after that interview and they were like, you really hate Romero? I'm like, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a gag. Yeah. But people didn't yeah. get it. Another thing, people didn't understand the aesthetic of the movie being Grindhouse either. I remember no. we, we went, we brought it to a film festival locally and we only showed a scene. It was a scene where Carrie Mullen gets killed. First mm -hmm. off, the festival denied the movie. They were like, it's too exploitative. And I was like, oh, fuck. But they're like, but we'll show one of the fake movie trailers. That is fun and it's great. And I was like, okay. So they showed it and we had previews of coming attractions and previews right. were spelled Yeah, wrong. yeah, yeah. You yeah. know how it is, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And we were sitting next to this guy uh, and the guy was like, they spelled previews wrong. Wonder what the hell Mickey Mouse shit this is. And I, I just was like, they don't get it. They don't get it. No, and I, no. I, that was kind of a bone chilling realization that I was like, people aren't really interested in revisiting that kind of time period or that kind of film. No. Well, I mean, in um, I read that during the actual Grindhouse release, a lot of people didn't see um, whatever <laughs> one came last. Yeah, because they, they walked out because they didn't understand the concept that you were getting two movies. It's like it's. It, the problem is when you pull a gag like that, it, it's like if you pretend to fall over in front of friends to impress them, there's always that chance that they're going to be like, yeah, you just fell over and you're, you're trying to pass it off as a joke. 
and, and in the same way that you set up a, like a persona in the same way that you do like a grindhouse thing i remember doing um some grindhouse style shots and people reacted really badly to it because they just figured that it really was that bad because sometimes being an independent filmmaker with a very low budget making a movie that's supposed to look low budget is not a good look and people don't get the joke and that's what i've been afraid of for the past couple of years because I didn't release it right when we were done with it. I held on to it. And for years, yeah. I was like, people would call me up and be like, hey, whatever happened to Macabre? Are you going to release that? And I thought that people were going to really judge me on this. And yeah. and, and I thought it was going to hurt my career. And plus, like, Ben was afraid it was going to hurt his career. I was afraid it was going to hurt Josh's career. Adam's yeah. career was pretty safe. He did the music. And that's, like, one of the best fucking things in the goddamn movie. The music yeah. is fucking amazing. Um, yeah. But, like, I really thought it was going to hurt some people's careers. And I was like, well, uh, this is done. I'm going to throw this away. Never going to release this again. Nobody's ever going to be knocking it. But now it's like I, I look at it differently because I look at it more so like, again, we were kids. Like, yeah. yes, we yeah. should have known better. Yes, kids nowadays make better shit than what I made. But given our circumstances. But that's now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's completely absolutely. different. Like, you know, uh, you know. People can uh, – Premiere is affordable. Avid, you know, was one of the main nonlinear editing systems that we had, and it wasn't anywhere near my grasp. You know, I was a poor kid. Yeah. No, of course, of course. No, it, it, it is nuts how things have changed now, but I think it's good. I think it's important in a sense to, um, you know, not to put it rudely, but kind of get over it, you know. And I'm the same. I'm I'm the exact same. I look back at some of those projects. Like I said, I I, I would rather bathe in acid than than watch them in front of a of a paying audience. But other people say to me, and they said, "Dude, you're a 19, and you and you had a feature, and it got finished, and it got released, and or what you know." And I and I look back at that objectively sometimes, as you should do with this, you know, and go, you know what, I was young. It was then, and we still did it. So, yeah. you know, why not put it out there? And it, like you said, yeah, I, I, I was the same for a few years. There were a few things where I thought I jumped the gun and I thought, oh, this is this is not going to look good. This is going to harm me. But then, like you said, you kind of get over it because you realize that you're changing all the time. You've always got new material to show people, it, it, you know the right people will will look at it in the right way and judge you in the right way for it. You know, I think that's where I came to a conclusion to release this is that one, I'm I'm giving I'm closing a chapter in my life that has been around for way too long and yeah. getting some closure from it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I don't know. There's a quote from a very talented actor comedian. I don't know if you're aware of him. Uh, uh, Jimmy O'Neill. Yeah, I know the name. He says. You know, once you release something, it's not yours anymore. That's true. And that really stuck with me. Mm. And I was kind of like, fuck this. This is going out to the public. You know, so that's kind of like, you know, I, you know, something I think about. Plus, I'm no longer afraid of people judging me on this movie anymore because on the DVD, if you do some research or on the Blu-ray, you can find other pieces of work that I've done, like the, the the making of documentary that we did is a lot better than the fucking movie, if you ask me. But if you ever want to see anything else that I've done recently, watch movie night. Watch my talk show. Yeah. Watch some of the uh, fake movie trailers that I made to try to get work, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are even those, you know, that's the thing I think I learned is that I am continually learning as an artist, as a filmmaker, as a as a human being. I'm learning to be better and I'm practicing my craft. And if people can't understand that that's on them it's not on me my that's goal true. is not to re i don't really care I, I i think my problem was i got so caught up in impressing other people i wanted to help and impress everybody else i want everybody to be happy yeah. but i wasn't making myself happy i was i was sacrificing my own art and my own shit you know and i, I think that's a young filmmakers thing isn't it that's yeah we all do it i think well and, and now i you know i'm older i have a i'm a lot wiser and I think I've kind of come to a point, like, you know, I was even embarrassed to show this to, to, to people I worked with who were like, there were people who really wanted to see Macabre Medicine. I was like, nah, 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 nah. We're not doing that again. Because um, <laughs> people fell asleep. We showed it once and people fell asleep. I love that. I don't. I love that. <laughs> Imagine how it made me feel in the moment. 
people thrown up in the cinema and falling asleep. That's what you want. You want a mixture. When I showed it at the STEM program, um, we made a teacher throw up. Now, she said she didn't. I don't know. She ran towards the bathroom really quick. <laughs> and it was it was just during the credit sequence. We we had a weird credit sequence back then. I love it. I love it. Well, you know what? It's all about creating emotion. And if emotions are coming out that, that thick and fast, that early into the movie, I think you're onto a winner. But I have to ask you, before we wrap this up, I've got to ask you. So what are the chances of macabre medicine too like have you ever thought about it come on i had to ask you that you must know that some people must be wondering uh so there there is a script we wrote There's a script a script we yes. wrote a script and uh i i said i would only do this if josh and ben do it um and ben wants to do it luckily and uh, Josh, as of recent, said, well, I'd like to revisit this. It's a very fun script. It's I am able to kind of retcon some things and then finally make the movie that I kind of wanted to make. Yeah. Not too yeah. dark. Uh, still very fun. And um, we are hoping to try to make that if if this does well, if this first one sells decently, we can kind of put some dough together from the sales of this and maybe we can put it towards a sequel and you know with the gear that i have and the knowledge and know-how that i have now and you know maybe get a couple people a couple of my friends to kind of work on this because you know i i, I kind of want to enjoy it this time i don't want to do all the work so yeah of course kick back a bit it's a very gory film huge because in this movie i'll give you a hint haywood is finally in the place that he always wanted to be a hospital which ah. yes yes so it's kind of like that's a natural we... progression yeah it's gonna it's gonna be that way isn't it well Brilliant. you know when i was thinking about it i was like you know if if macabre medicine one was in the set like the 70s uh macabre medicine two has to be the 80s sequel and i was right. like you know halloween macabre medicine two halloween yeah. two those are the, the kind hospital. of stuff. Yep. yeah man so there's a lot of things that we're going to be doing with that we're going to try to get a budget for it and hopefully shoot it in the next couple of years or next year. Hey, well, you, the, the good thing about this is you never know how many more uh, massive adoring fans you might get of just uh, this crazy grindhouse style movie who, you know, haven't maybe not watched that much of this kind of thing. You know, I think it's opening up new audiences. You know what? I will say this. I know what kind of movie this is. I know, like I said, it's not great. I don't think it's particularly bad either. People who say it's bad, they end up quoting it like a week later. Like, fuck, yeah, it's in my head. But I really hope what people get out of this movie is I hope, one, they have fun. You know, I hope this is something that college students get around and make fun of it, like The Room. Uh, but two, I hope it kind of inspires people to, you know, not doubt yourself and to just go out and make something with your friends. Because it was one of the best experiences of my life, yet one of the hardest things, but I learned so much from it. And I hope mm. people look at it and go like, fuck, if a bunch of fucking dumbass kids can make this, so can I. And that's yeah. kind of how I felt about The Evil Dead when I first saw it was I was like, wow, a bunch of kids made this movie. I can do that. And I hope yeah. that – I'm not comparing this to Evil Dead at all. I think it's in the same kind of vein of how they made it. I'm not saying it's as good as Evil Dead, and I'm not saying it's as uh, – uh, 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 you know, uh, I don't, I don't but even... the whole origins and the situation are so similar in the vibe of like, you know, the, the how you know, um, Raimi made the movie with all friends around and that, and it's great. You got to love that vibe. It's those are the those are the days that end up being the best days of your life. You look back and you go, wow, it was a hot summer and we did this, and you know, uh, we were young and full of ambition and we just went for it, and that will stay with you forever. So I think it's great that you you put you know, find a bit of closure on it by putting it out there because it's it's got to feel good, surely. It does. And it's finally, it, it's it's a way for me to kind of look at it and go, uh, you know what? Maybe I didn't, you know, money was nothing. The, the, the budget that I had, my savings, at least I have an experience because, you know, I could have blown that 15 grand at the strip club. <laughs> and wouldn't that have been terrible? I've never been to a strip club in my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, but oh, like dear, I could have blown dear. the money on something stupid like Ring Pops and Starburst and and I made a film. 
And I, yeah. well, I, I have this thing so forever true. now, for better or for worse. Yes. It's yes. like a marriage. You, I put the ring on it. You know, you might have gotten it pregnant, but I put the ring on it. It's so true. That is a good way of looking at it. I, you know, so many people go through their lives and not to sound unkind, but they don't really do anything. You know, it doesn't matter, particularly you go, well, that's not my best work or that is my best work or don't know about that. But they're all things that you've done and they're all important. And they all the thing I find about movies really interesting when I do look back fondly or not of like old projects, putting the quality aside, they are like a snapshot in time. And I remember exactly how I felt when we filmed that. I know I remember how I felt when we did that. You know what I mean? And you look back and it's it's like a time capsule into your sort of creativity and your life, really. No, 100 percent. And, you know, one of the best things I've ever done in the past couple of years was sit back and watch a 16 year old me think his way through a movie and go, you yeah. know what? If I could go back and tell that kid, hey, it's going to be all right. You know? Yeah. I You, you know, because technically I was like this guy I mean, look i'm not where i want to be in my career but you know i still think that hey i still kind of made it i'm still stupid enough to i'm too stupid to quit you know i'm still going you know there's a lot to be said to be still going you know what i mean and that's what it is longevity consistency is key it, you know you don't have to be firing at the top constantly you just have to be firing and keep going and people will respect that they'll respect your work and, um, you know, they'll be excited to revisit old stuff and they'll be excited to see what you come up with in the future, of course. What's in the future for you? Me personally? Sure. Uh, probably another feature when the dust has settled from Artifacts of Fear. Um, I'm, I'm doing that thing where I'm kicking around a few scripts, whatever the fuck that means. But, I'm, you know, so hopefully, like yourself, I think continue... As, as you mean to go on, you know, not much has changed, but the quality gets better and the ideas get better and the gear gets better. You know, like yourself, probably looking back at that footage, you can go, I'm still that kid. I'm like, I may have changed a lot, but when I look back at old footage and I'm like, I'm still that guy that just, you know, loves to tell a story. So for me, uh, hopefully more stories, more movies, I hope. Some things in the pipeline, but nothing too serious just yet. Oh, great. This has been a blast. Thank you for having me on your uh, show. Hey, well, thanks for coming along. It's been great to talk about it. And um, I'm excited to see the uh, the package and everything as it comes and see what you come up with in the future, of course. Absolutely. And uh, 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 I'm excited for a dead pixel. Oh, yes. Everyone's excited for that. So, people, you're going to have to keep your eyes peeled because... Um, there's going to be some fun stuff coming because when you watch all this stuff now, it's like it's just the beginning, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I think I think I'm having a bit of a resurrection in just my own self. You know, I think I'm going to be working on a lot of cool things coming up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to believe in yourself and stay motivated. Well, thanks for coming on. I've enjoyed it as always. Oh, was I supposed to say something? I don't know. So once the interview start. <laughs> I don't know how we do this, the ending. How do we do it? Hi, this has been two filmmakers wanking each other off. Signing off. <laughs> I don't know. Thanks for watching, guys. I'm going to hit stop on this.